we have to shift gears now because it's time for a laugh, which incidentally I do hear is also good for preventing cancer. When it comes to creative activism, I'd say one of the most difficult things to do is turn tragedy into comedy. Incorporating mass shootings, climate change, war, poverty, famine, lack of health care and education, incorporating that into an honest, straightforward newscast is one thing, but making those things funny? That's a whole nother fucking challenge. And perhaps even more challenging is digging into the equal parts boring and mysterious layers of corporatocracy, pulling out the most important juicy bits and turning them into comedy. I actually think I'd rather attempt this intricate money origami piece, which is actually pretty badass. But turning the corporatocracy into comedy is something that Lee Camp and the Redacted Tonight team does every week. And last week, Lee sat down with me to talk about his approach to both comedy and tragedy, activism in the entertainment industry, and life on stage and in the newsroom. Take a look. What came first for you, activism or comedy? Comedy, definitely. Uh, I wanted to be a comedy writer since I was like 12, and then I finally started performing at like 17. My stand-up comedy was very observational at, at first, very uh, Seinfeldian at first, and then it grew and I became both interested in political comedians, but also more interested in politics and what was going on in the world. I feel like my, my true education, or at least a lot of it, came after college when I started reading the important books that you don't really read in college. So. <laughs> Uh, well, then what flipped the switch? If it wasn't a book that you read in college, what got you to start listening to political comedians and paying attention to politics? I was molested by Henry Kissinger. <laughs> it was awkward, and I've never gotten over it. I'm so sorry, but you guys heard it first. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, it was a, a bit of a slow progression over a, a year or two. Um, I just started doing more activism, and uh, I, I mean... If I, if I point to one moment, and I, it certainly was not one moment, but one moment that definitely sticks out was uh, a very small handful of activists in Texas, um, and, and I, in my own small way, helped stop uh, a death row inmate from being executed. Now, I give them 99% of the credit, but I also, I was in New York at the time, and I was, you know, posting about it and stuff, but what does that do? And, and uh I then called the uh, the governor of Texas, which was Rick Perry at the time, and you know it was days it was days until this guy was going to be executed. And unlike just about every death row inmate you've ever heard of, the prosecution admitted this guy had not killed anyone. He'd been in a car. He was driving. His friend got out got in a fight, killed someone, they were going to put the driver to death who had nothing to do with it. And in Texas, that's legal because it's called the law of parties. You were around someone that committed murder. So uh, they were going to execute him, and uh, I called, and they, you know, they did the same thing. Oh, we'll add you to the tally saying don't execute this guy. And it kind of drove me nuts. I was like, there's got to be some way I can at least annoy these people a little more. And so I called the next day, didn't say I'd called before, and pretended to be a filmmaker, you know, made up a fake studio and all this info and, and basically got her to believe that I was this film studio and wanted to do a, a documentary on the death of Kenneth Foster. And she puts me through the press secretary. I give her the whole thing and I say, we want an interview with the governor. And she says, well, it's maybe a possibility. Um, when would you want this? And I'm like, well, Kenneth Foster has to be dead. So let's wait till he's dead and then we'll... And then we can do the interview. Uh, and she's like, okay, well, I'll bring it to the governor's attention. Uh, how do we get in touch with you? And I was like, well, the movie email will be up soon. It's bloodontexashands.com or info at. And, uh, and so there's this long, awkward pause. And then she takes down the information. And, and that was the last I heard about it. But I don't doubt that the press secretary's job is to bring information like that to the governor. So I think that pressure, along with a lot of other pressure, uh, is what ultimately made Rick Perry commute this guy's sentence. And Rick Perry murdered more people than Bush did as governor. So this was not a guy who was big into commuting death row inmates. And when I heard that it, the sentence had been commuted, I remember feeling immense excitement and immense like burden of like, oh fuck, a very small number of people can make a difference. A very small number of people can save a man's life. And it really puts that fire into you of like, you know, the, this, the, the little thing I do, the little choices I make can make a larger uh, significant difference. And uh, I, I feel like from then on out, I was a pretty uh, uh, 
uh, um, regular activist. I don't know, active activist. <laughs> An active activist. I like that. Some people will say, "Well, I don't, I don't put my activism into my art because I'd like to keep them separate." Uh, why did you decide to combine them, or was there even like a moment where where you decided that, or where, was it just kind of automatic that you would combine comedy and activism? I had just had enough with ticket sales. <laughs> and I wanted to slow everything down and just decrease the number of people that were forwarding and looking at my stuff. And it's worked like a charm. Uh, no, I not as much I, as it's worked for me. <laughs> I, I I just I uh, I didn't see any other I didn't see any other way around it. I didn't I, I I was bored by the stuff I was doing on stage. I got to a point that I didn't care if you know, I alienated a club book or a comedy club book or, and it's tough to really know how often you haven't been booked somewhere because you were talking politics. I do know that my entire, after I was on Fox News and called them a parade of propaganda, my entire college touring uh, schedule dried up immediately almost. Um, and I, I was fine with that, but at the same time, I think that's a, it was pretty direct cause and effect. It was like these colleges now when they Googled me, saw that clip, were like, oh, we don't want a political guy. And, uh, and so I do know a lot of doors closed, but at the same time I was doing something I cared about. It's like, I, I think at least the people that do what we do, uh, activism with art, uh, I think most of them are kind of like, fuck it all. I don't care. I, I, this is what needs to be said and I'll say it. So why is it so important to you to make that trade-off? And so, and, and then in turn, how does that make you feel about the comedy industry as it stands today? I mean, there's a lot of shit out there. There is. I guess that goes with a lot of art forms. There's a lot of shit out there. There's a lot of good stuff out there too. But uh, I do think there's a certain line. It's it's funny how what what people think is offensive, what people think is edgy, because people people will say you know like like in the opening monologue to uh, Amy Schumer on SNL this week, she did a joke about how she had to wash her niece's vagina, and I'm sure people uh, you know she's talking to the nation and talking about washing her niece's vagina, and I'm sure that they were like that's really edgy, she's super edgy, but in our day and age, it's like that's not really that edgy. That's what most comedians do, and if you were to turn on Comedy Central most times times of the day, 85% of the jokes are going to be about uh, vaginas in some form or another, or at least dicks. Uh, so I don't find that edgy. I think what's edgy in terms of people aren't going to book you and stuff is is insulting, you know, politics, going after certain political uh, ideas, going after religion sometimes, although sometimes even that's become cool, uh, and and going after, like, the things we take for granted, like... Uh, like working all day in a job you hate and, and how we've been indebted to, to make that happen, you know? And so I think it's that, that type of stuff is what should be called edgy. It's not, but it's like that's the stuff that stops you from getting late night shows. That's why I'm not on, uh, I was going to say Letterman, but he's gone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Seth Meyers every night. At the end of your show, you say keep fighting. And of course, you, you, know, you have a lot of, you work with a lot of different organizations and you, you speak on a lot of different topics. But let's say I'm like the average American who is either on the fence or on the other side of the fence and like thinks activism is just as scary of a word as feminism. How do you how do you even start fighting in order to keep fighting? Like what what's like the first step? Well, if you're one of these people that finds, you know, these words scary, activism and feminism, I think the hope is that my show would draw you in with simply the comedy. And so you kind of don't realize that you're being uh you 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 you're you're accepting that feminism is cool and that activism is cool at least long enough to watch the show because you're laughing and enjoying it. And I think that if it were just me talking like I am right now, straightforward, uh, I might I might lose people. And that's why you and I talk about art a lot and, and different ways of, of appealing to people that wouldn't necessarily watch this stuff. Um, but you, in terms of first steps, I think people should not be overwhelmed because I think there's a tendency to just be like, well, the world's fucked. What do I do? I, I, I can't take out my composting. The fucking environment's dying. Like, <laughs> who gives a fuck? People should find something that they care about the most, a smaller issue, and tackle it. You know, some people fully devote themselves to the local food movement and to getting farmer's markets in a lot of areas, and, and that is their life. And that's, I think that's wonderful. I think we need people to be kind of localized like that.
Right, and as, as Chris Hedges talks about in his book, like the thing that's really going to save us are these communities coming together on a smaller scale and creating these alternatives. And right. you see that with climate camps in Europe, like people creating these alternative societies as they're trying to dismantle uh, capitalism. So um, looking into the, into the future here, um, you, have, uh, you had a Moment of Clarity book where it was the, the rants from your very popular YouTube series, Moment of Clarity. And I understand you have another book coming out of the intro rants from, your, from Redacted Tonight. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to put out another book of those opening rants, and it is titled do you have a title by chance that I could <laughs> that I could use? <laughs> Get my people on that immediately. On that. Yeah, no, I haven't titled it yet, but it just needs to be uh, put together. So hopefully I will be presenting that soon. And then the other big thing is we are doing a big live show in New York that's not going to be like the TV show. It's going to be stand-up comedy because luckily me and all of us on uh, Redacted Tonight are stand-up comedians. And so we're going to do a cool big night. It's looking like it's likely going to be uh, free tickets and uh, free drink and November 20th at, at Caroline's. I got you with a free drink, huh? <laughs> um, and it should be just like an amazing night. I'm hoping so. For more on Lee Camp, check out LeeCamp.net, and you can catch Redacted Tonight every Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern on RT, and thereafter on YouTube at YouTube.com slash Redacted Tonight.